on this episode of the After the Timeout podcast in partnership with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association, we round out 2022 with head coach Travis Steele. Coach Steele is the head coach of Miami, Ohio University. We talked to Coach Steele about growing up in Indiana basketball, having a brother in coaching, working with officials, and taking over a new program. As always, thank you for listening to the After the Timeout podcast. Have a safe, happy, and healthy new year. So we like to start every episode with what we call the opening tip. So we wanted to talk to you about kind of growing up in Indiana, right? A basketball state, um, you know, kind of what your experiences were with basketball in Indiana playing. Um, and, then, and, you know, you kind of grew up in a, in, in a town of 10,000 people was like, how was your town with basketball? And, you know, um, because, you know, you talk to people from Indiana, high school, college, and, you know, obviously Indiana is a basketball hotbed. So it's always good to hear those kind of stories. Yeah, you know, I, I was really fortunate. Obviously, uh, in, in the state of Indiana, uh, basketball is huge, right? And it's, you almost put uh, basketballs in your hand when you grow up. You know, you you drive around. It seems like every house has a hoop outside or, you know, their garage or they have a court or, or something. I think that's pretty normal in the state of Indiana. Um, you know, growing up in Danville, Indiana, man, was was awesome. You know, it was a lot of fun, man. It's a small town, like you said, of about 10,000 people. Um, it would be sold out, you know, when you go to the games, you know, whether that was football, basketball, whatever it was, you know, the town would always get behind, you know, all the uh, all the sports and all the uh, at, at Danville Community High School, man. And we were fortunate, man. We had a really good high school coach. We had a really good high school coach. We had Todd Licklider, who ended up being the uh, the head coach of Butler, and then Iowa, and then most recently at Evansville and Marion College as well. He uh, he coached my brother. I was I was I was younger when he was coach there. Sorry, for my, my dog right there is crazy. It let him out, man. Um, and uh, he uh, he kind of changed, I think, the basketball program in our in our in our uh, in our town, though. Todd Licklider did, and he really got us to start winning. And uh, I had a tremendous coach named Brian Barber, who's still there today. Right. And he has turned Danville into a really, really good, consistent program, which, as you guys know, some sometimes some of the hardest things to do is to win consistently. Everybody can do it every once in a while, but he's he's consistently put his teams in the regionals and semifinals and and all that in, in class 3A in the state of Indiana. But, man, I, again, just fortunate. My brother was a, co- was a college coach as well. So like in a lot of ways, man, I was the youngest of five. And uh, so when I when they'd be playing all their sports, man, I was getting dragged to every sporting event uh, known to mankind, whether it was football, cheerleading, basketball. You know, obviously basketball was heavy. All three of my brothers played, and uh, so I, I got uh, I got thrown to the wolves early, uh, so to speak, as far as basketball goes. Uh, I always like those youngest of blank because they always seem to be the toughest ones because they get beat up on for years. Hey, listen, and that, and that happened. I can tell you that a lot. Like my uh, my brothers would beat up on me all the time, but you learn. Listen, you keep coming back, right? You get up mm-hmm. off the mat, and you uh, and you want to keep on competing. Whether that was with out on the court, we had a little outdoor basketball court, and uh, or whether that was say playing baseball in, in our yard or whatever it was, man, we uh, we loved to compete. So we wanted to just start with you a little bit on your journey because we know you started out as a high school coach and, and, you know, Todd and I have, have coached high school for years. Todd's now in, in the collegiate level, but you know, what, when you started out as a high school coach, maybe what were some of those sharp lessons you learned about coaching real early on? Um, and, and maybe just some things that you've taken now into your, your collegiate days, but you still, you've taken those from your, your high school experience. You know, I was really young when I started coaching high school basketball. Um, man, I was so fortunate to work for a guy named Steve Whitty, who is a legendary coach in Indianapolis and in Indiana, won multiple state titles there at Ben Davis High School. And he gave me an opportunity, you know, and uh, I was a volunteer initially. And, man, I just dove all the way in. And the thing that I learned early on was that, you know, because I was I was almost the same age, basically, as the guys that I was coaching. Right. So how was I going to be able to gain the respect? I think number one, showing that I was going to go over and beyond to serve them. 
right? Like if, if a guy wanted to get extra shots up and wanted some extra work in, never, ever would I say, hey, I'm too busy or it's too late or that's too early. Um, I, I tried to serve those guys. And then number two, I think players really respect organization, right? Like, uh, you know, if you had an organized plan of their development, um, I think they really, really respected that. So every workout that I would come to, and before I would even go to the workout, I would say, hey, listen, here's the things that I think we really need to get better at. Here's your weaknesses. Here's your strengths. We want to continue to, you know, make those even stronger, but we also got to work on your weaknesses. This is how we're going to do it. And then at every, every workout that I would show up to, I'd always have it all typed up, everything to the second, to the minute, all, every drill. There was no wasted time. And I was hoping that those guys would respect that piece, you know, because at that time, you know, when I was young, it was like, man, I had to figure out um, how to gain the respect. And listen, Coach Whitty was such a good coach. He had his offensive and defensive system, and he knew how to teach those uh, so well. A lot of stuff that I still took with me today. And uh, But I was like, man, I'm going to make these guys better. That's my big – I wanted them to get that culture of development and getting guys in the gym. I wanted to be that guy. And that that's what I've kind of taken with me today because that's what our program – at Miami is now going to be known for is the, is the development of our players, both on and off the court, you know, truly being invested in them um, and giving them our best every single day. So you, you mentioned your brother for our listeners who don't know uh, coach's brother is, is John Gross, another, another really good college coach. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about like some of the things you and your brother have learned being in the, in the profession, right? Like bouncing ideas off of you, uh, picking each other's brains, uh, learning from experiences that you've had at your different stops. Um, and then maybe what are the, some of the things that uh, that he has done to influence you um, along the way? Yeah. Um, listen, I, I always tell everybody, listen, I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for John. I mean, he, he opened a lot of doors and avenues for me uh, that again, that, you know, he's helped me along the way immensely, immensely, whether that's getting into the profession, um, showing me how, how to do things the right way, right? Um, you know, treating people right, um, being organized, working hard. You know, listen, he, he's been my, uh, my role model, you know, since I was, man, since I was young, man, I would live with him in the summers. Every t every summer, I, I would go down to North Carolina State. He was an assistant in North Carolina State for for a while, and every summer I'd live with him, right? And I just got exposed to college basketball at a young age. Herb Sendek was the head coach down there. Sean Miller was an assistant. My brother was an assistant. Um, Larry Harris was an assistant. They had a great staff, and I got exposed to it at an early age. But you know, we bounce we bounce things off each other a lot. You know, obviously we're in the same league now. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm going to cheer for Akron <laughs> every time they don't play Miami. I'm going to cheer for him. Uh, but he uh, but we, we do. We bounce a lot of ideas off, you know, whether it's culture, um, whether it's an X's and O's, you know, you know, defensive, offensive idea or a, you know, like like for the, for example, this year, we have a smaller point guard here at Miami. I've never had a small point guard. You know, Makai Larry's a really good player, but he's five foot six. And he John had a smaller point guard. Two years ago, uh, Christian Jackson, Lauren, he, he was a tremendous player, but he was five foot six. You know, how how is he able to overcome maybe his size on the defensive end, right, to where it wasn't a liability? Um, you know, so we bounce ideas off each other nonstop, man. And, and uh, you know, he, he's been a uh, an incredible, an incredible resource for me. I know that because he's a great coach. I got a lot of respect for him, as, obviously, as a coach, but he's even a better person. Man, we got him to say nice things about his brother on the air. Well, he'll never live that one down now, Todd. <laughs> <laughs> um, just just as a, a an interesting, we haven't had this this question with a lot of coaches, but you know, we want Todd and I wanted to hit with you about just talking about working with officials. You know, during a game, you know, yeah. do you have a way you establish early rapport with them? Are you, you know, and different coaches handle it different ways. Some are more conversational. Um, you know, do you kind of just feed off of their energy? Let, let's just start there with, you know, how do you establish that rapport early in a game? So I think um, early on when I first became head coach, um, I, I learned this, man. It's like, man, the more that I complained at the officials, the more my players 
complain at the officials and it can become a distraction. My number one job during the game is to coach my team. That's the number one thing. And, but also you got to let your players know that you have their back. You can't complain at every call. <laughs> you know, it's like, cause during the game, you always feel like, man, you're getting a bad whistle or they're against me. We're playing five on eight. And it's like, listen, do the officials miss a call here and there? Absolutely. They do. They're human beings. We all make mistakes, coaches, players. And the thing that I love is when an official owns it. I love that. That gains, that guy, that gains a lot of credibility with me. If a guy will come over and even if he missed it, he comes over after the media timeout and he says, Hey, Trav, I just want to let you know, man, I missed that call. I apologize. I say, hey, no problem, man. I, I, I really, that's what the great officials do. The, the, the officials that are sensitive don't do that. Right. And, uh, and I think they learn and shoot. I learn as well. We all, we're all getting better. Um, so I think the thing that I've learned, I thought I was too emotional with the officials early on. And like I said, I thought our players took on that, uh, that personality a little bit as well. And, and it distracted us from executing when we really needed to and in, in, in critical moments. And so, you know, I'm, I, I have conversations with those officials kind of throughout the game, just to be honest, get to know them a little bit. Um, you know, like for example, now I'm, I, you know, being in the big East, I knew those officials very, very well, uh, as an assistant. And then when I was as a head coach and now I'm learning, honestly, a whole new kind of, uh, officiating crews here in the Mac. And, um, uh, it's been fun, man, but again, getting to know guys, you know, again, they're human beings, <laughs> just, you know, they're not just officials out there, you know, they're, they're human beings. And, just, and again, if I disagree with something, I think you got to figure out how to do it in a, uh, without being too loud. I think that's really important. I think people get embarrassed very quickly. Like if you do hand motions or wave people off or, you know, yelling and screaming constantly, I don't think that really works with officials. I just don't. Um, I think you can have conversations with them and ask them, hey, why did you call that? Uh, tell, give me the why or what did you see? How can I help my player in that instance, right? How, how, what could he have done? differently and, and have that conversation. I think they appreciate that. And that gains credibility with them, right? And it's about gaining that trust and that credibility. And again, at the end of the day, I always say this, man, officials aren't going to decide a game. It, it, sometimes as fans, fans always think the officials decide a game and it's, you know, the players are going to decide the game and, and, and we got to help our players figure out solutions throughout the game. Uh, kind of a follow up to that. So you mentioned like knowing all the officials, right? And you know, you kind of see the same people. And um, I, you know, I, I kind of want to go a different aspect of like almost scouting the officials, right? You know, going into a game knowing, okay, you know, you guys look at, hey, this guy maybe calls more. You know, you see it in the NFL a lot, right? You see when there's a big game, this crew is called holdings this many times or whatever. Um, does that kind of go into preparing your players for for that game? say, hey, yo, we got to be really hands off here. They're going to call a lot of che hand checks or they're going to call this or whatever it may be. Yeah, 100%. You know, you, you know officials, you know what they like to call and what they don't like to call. Or you know some guys that have a very, very short fuse, <laughs> right? And if, if you look at a guy the wrong way, boy, he's going <laughs> to, it could go the other direction for you. You know, how you deal with the, how your players deal with the officials. And, and I think, uh, you know, yes. I mean, we, we always tell our guys, hey, you know, what, what do they like to call specific guys? I'll know who the crew is usually about four or five days, I think, lead, you know, before the game. I get I get the officials on my desk and there's all this data out there, right, of what they call. And and, and we and we look that up and and uh, just so we know kind of what to expect and what our players to, what what they can expect going into the game. You know, you don't want any surprises. And uh because like I said, man, there's some, it, again, if you if you look wrong at a few officials or you try to, they feel like stand them up a little bit. Oh, I'm just telling you. And we've, we've I, listen, and that was part of my problem when I first became head coach. It's like, man, I was complaining to officials, but then they would complain and it would just become, it could become a nightmare. And it could go the other direction very, very quickly. And uh, like I said, because they are human beings, <laughs> right? They're human beings. They're obviously incredible officials. We got great officials in college basketball, but but they are human beings. And then um, 
you know, obviously it's, this is different in college, but I, I want to talk a little bit about like the, your instant, like your, your challenge and instant replay process, right? Like if you're looking at a call, yeah. um, you know, obviously you have the benefit of having multiple coaches and somebody looking at it and, and video and, and things like that, but kind of what is your process with, with that of trying to be like, Hey, we should, we should look at it. And obviously time goes into that too. Sometimes they, they automatically look at it, but like, what is your kind of your process with that of getting officials to kind of see certain things and, and maybe a, a call trying to, trying to flip that. That'd be awesome in college basketball. If we could get the, the uh, like the challenge flag or whatever you want to call it. Right. You know, it's like, um, that'd be awesome. Um, we review everything in college basketball on that last minute, you know, at the very end of the games. And it's like, man, that end of the game can last 30 minutes <laughs> by the time you look up because every coach, even if you don't have a timeout, I say I'm out of timeouts. I'm just going to say, hey, listen, <laughs> that needs to be reviewed. It's within the time frame. And that's what a lot – that's – you're trying to get around the rules, right? So I, I I would rather see, instead of reviewing every single one, hey, let's give the challenge. That way you can't just be able to use a time. Does that make sense? You use like – when you don't have a timeout, because that happened to me last year. I think we were playing against Creighton in a close game. and you know, McDermott did it. And I was like, dude, I told the official, I said, it's clearly off of them. I mean, not, I mean, it wasn't even like 90%. It was a hundred percent. And you're going to review that. He said, I'd do the same thing for you. <laughs> I said, well, that's not, that's, I said, that's not my point. That's not, that's not what it's supposed to be for, you know? And uh, I would love to get that challenge though. I think that would be awesome. That'd be an awesome addition. I, I would really enjoy it. I'd have my ops guy all over that deal just so they could watch it. You know, that would be kind of, Kind of interesting, that different dynamic too to the game. I I actually have an interesting follow up to that. Do you think, in a way, and I was just thinking about this as you said it. Do you think, in a way, that TV, the the playing constantly of the replays over and over. Do you think officials now side towards that because they're afraid to be wrong and not change it and be questioned by everyone? One hundred percent. I would agree. Okay. 100%. Everything's being evaluated and they can't screw it up. <laughs> I mean, like everything's being evaluated and they all want to referee, obviously, in the NCAA tournament. And if they miss a couple big calls, man, that can impact their ability to get into the tournament. So it's it's, it's very understandable. You know, like I, I get it why they're doing it. And But man, it's like my wife always says, she's like, man, we were watching a game last night, <laughs> late night. And she said, man, these last minute of the game, man, they last 20 minutes. I said, babe, it's the end of the game. I said, well, wait, we'll, we'll put on another show in a minute. She said, well, that's going to be in 20 minutes, you know, because all the fouling and reviews and all that stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, the officials don't want to be wrong. I don't I don't blame them. And, and you want to get it right as much as possible, right, because you want to – the players deserve that. And, uh, you know, because, again, there's there's obviously a lot of, at stake, especially at the uh, in the college basketball realm. It's big business. And so I wanted to get into like off the court and, you know, your family time and, and carving that out, right. As, as a coach at any level, that's really, really hard to do. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do you go about that? Especially in season um, carving out that family time. Um, you know, obviously at some points it probably just happens whether you have days off or, you know, around the holiday time where you maybe don't play during a certain period. Right. But um you know, maybe some things that you do to to kind of help other coaches navigate that that challenge of you know you want to put all into your team, but you also have to you have to be there with your family and, and put it all into your family. Yeah, it's 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 a it's a tricky uh, it's tricky, you know. And and you know, before I took the Miami job, I told my wife before we took it, you know, I just said, uh, you know, listen, I'm I'm not going to miss anything. Number one, I'm I, I my my number one job is to be a great dad. I got two little boys. I got a little girl on the way as well here in the next month. Um, and I want to be a great husband. Right. That's I'm I'm not going to sacrifice those responsibilities uh for for a job. I'm just not I'm not doing it. And and I expect our my assistant coaches to do the same. Right. Like I they uh all three of my assistant coaches have kids. And listen, I, I tell those guys, do your job. I don't I've worked for guys in the past where I had to be in the office for 16 hours a day. I've also worked for guys that, Hey, you know, get your job done and just however you want to do it. You want to work a little bit at home. You want to work at an office. I don't care as long as you're working, we're all good. 
And I'd say that's more of my mentality because you got to have a little bit of balance in your life. You really do. And, and I think your players need to see that. And I think their players, if you're really going to create a family atmosphere, they got to see your families around, right? Because I'm tr- one of my goals is to develop our guys in the, in the responsible uh, men. At some point, they're probably going to have kids someday. And, you know, so how, how we got to be a great role model for our young men in our locker room. Um, but it is tricky. I mean, because listen, like I'm trying to turn this program around at Miami and it takes a lot of hours. But like I coach, like, like for example, I coach my uh, my fourth graders AAU team and I coach his school ball team even during the winter. I go to practice twice a week in the, in the evenings. I make time. I make it work. He loves basketball. I don't want to bl- in a blink of an eye, you know, he'll be, he'll be driving, right. He'll be 16 years old in high school, man. And like, I'm not missing anything as much stuff as I can be at. I will absolutely be at, I don't care how tired I am or what I'm doing. Uh, when I get home, I'm home. Like I'm, I'm not, I used to, pro- I used to have this problem. It's like the life. I feel like this business teaches you to have, it's like a rat race, man, like constant nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year and then you realize it's like for what <laughs> like what why at the sacrifice of everything else my family which should be number one in my life um so when I'm home I'm home I don't take phone calls honestly between when, my, when I get home you know say six o'clock all the way till 8 30 I'm not taking phone calls unless it's a 911 emergency I'm not doing it. I'm gonna spend time with my kids until they go to bed Right. Like I got to spend quality time with my wife, whether it's a date night or once a week, you know, make room for it. Even if she's tired, I'm tired. You still got to do it. Right. Like those things matter, I think. And they go a long ways because wives, basketball wives, man, they're, they're, they're saints. I don't know how they do it. I mean, they they sacrifice a lot. And my wife's amazing and she's tough and she's independent. But, uh, you know. I, I got to be there for her and I got to make sure she knows how appreciative I am of all the sacrifices she makes for me to chase my dreams of my, for my career. And, uh, you know, so I think you just got to make time. You got to, you got to put time into it. Um, and you got to make sacrifices. Listen, just like anything else, if it's important, you'll do it. If it's not, <laughs> you won't. Right. Like that's what I always say. So, um, but I, I try to, and I try to make sure our staff does that as well. I don't want them there at 6.00 AM to, to midnight. I mean, that's just ridiculous. I mean, it, that's not working very smart to me. All right. So we want to trans- transition into our segment we call halftime adjustments. This is more basketball related. Um, so you mentioned, right, you know, you, you're, you're taking over the program, you're kind of rebuilding it. But when you, at each stop you've had, right, and you got you to look at your players and you know, okay, this is what we got. We got the recruits coming in. Um, what is kind of your process of, of figuring out, okay, this is this is what I ultimately system want to run, but then this is what we got. So, you know, yeah. what what can we do? How do you go about kind of figuring out y- your blend of, you know, what you want to do ultimately as a coach, and then what your players can do with what you have? Yeah, I, that's a great question, man. Because that because you can go one of two routes. You can say, hey, listen, I'm gonna fit. I'm gonna do my system regardless of if it fits or not. Or you could go the alternative and just say, hey, listen, I'm just going to, you know what, fit it right to what we we'll do, whatever with whatever we got, you know, personnel wise, that's what we're going to do. Um, every decision I'm making, listen, Miami hasn't won in 16 years. It's been a long time. This is still the all time winningest program in this league, won more games, won more championships, put more guys in the NBA than any other MAC program, but we haven't won in 16 years. And so everything that I do, is about year three. If it's not going to positively impact year three, then I'm not going to do it. All right. So that's my, that's kind of my North star, so to speak. Like when I took over the program, you know, so saying that I'm going to get my system in right now, whether it fits or not, I really don't care because I need my freshmen in year three when they're juniors to know the terminology, how we practice how we do things so they can teach these incoming, because we got signed a heck of a 2023 class, a great class. We got a couple of Chicago guys, Makai Cooper and Jackson, Kentucky, phenomenal guys. 
We got five really good guys. Those guys need to learn from our what, what are right now our current freshmen at Miami. That creates that leadership and that pride and that belief that you need. Because the best teams are player-led. Everybody knows that. They're not coach-led. And the way they're player-led is if guys know what the heck they're doing. <laughs> right? Like, so um, so offensively and defensively, I know exactly how I want to play. We're a pack line defensive team, man-to-man. We're going to be more gap-oriented. On the offensive end, we're going to be about great pace. We're going to play with as much space as we possibly can. And we are going to be a player movement, ball movement team. We're not going to be – we're going to be more – concepts than we are set plays we have about five set plays in and that's it and I want to teach those guys how to play and right now for year one does it get frustrating at times absolutely because <laughs> it may not fit exactly what we got right now but let's I have to keep on reminding myself hey listen year three year three year three because I know this when these freshmen become sophomores and these sophomores become juniors then all of a sudden we're going to have a chance to be pretty dang good. So that's kind of been my mentality kind of going into this job. Because, listen, it's it's been a long time, man. It's been 16 years. Like, shoot, some of the kids we were recruiting have never seen a winning season by Miami since they've been born, right? Like, and, uh, you know, again, I, I, I think we have to think a little bit unique and a little bit different um, in order to get this thing turned. So I think uh, I just have an interesting follow up before we go forward is kind of thinking about that year three concept. I, when you said that, I I loved that idea and that that fits college coaches, high school coaches, professional coaches. I mean, that fits everybody. Um, you know, how do you as a coach, you kind of hit on it, but I, I wanted to go a little bit deeper. How do you as a coach in some of those darker year one and year two moments, how do you kind of <laughs> remind yourself like, Okay, they're learning. We we might have just lost to a team maybe we shouldn't have, and maybe in year three we won't. But just kind of, how do you? And maybe your staff as well. Like, hey guys, you know we, we're 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 going towards year three. Yeah, I, I hired a great staff. Number one, I the most important thing you can do as a coach is is hire great people around you. And I had an absolute grand slam. I really did. I I've hired a couple of coaches two guys in particular that have been a part of turnarounds, right? At the mid-major level, Rob Summers was at Cleveland State uh, with Coach Gates, Dennis Gates, and turned that program around in, in three years, man. Like, they got that thing rolling. Jonathan Holmes, same thing at Elon. When he was down there with Mike Schrage, then Mike left for uh, for Duke. But uh, he was at William & Mary for a long time. So those guys have been at this level for a really, really long time. They've been a part of turnarounds. So they've seen it before. Um, that helps. That helps me uh, at times because there are some of those dark moments where you start saying like, God, man, maybe we should just do this short term. Nope, can't do that. I have it in my, my, in my front page of my notebook. I carry it in my pocket as well. A piece of paper of this talk says year three. <laughs> just to constantly remind myself uh, that's what every decision has to be pointed towards. And that's culture too. It's not just X's and O's, right? Like mm -hmm. I am fighting for, I have to develop a competitive culture in our program and a togetherness in our program that's been lacking for a while. And every day, man, we are battling, fighting for every inch we can with those things. And maybe that's that's probably more important than the X's and O's that we're doing, right? Our style of play is just, man, just kind of developing that culture. Um, it's, it's a challenge. But again, you know, Rome wasn't built in one night, you know, and it's it's going to take time. It is, it's, it's going to take time. You can't put a Band-Aid over a gaping wound, right? Like it's, um, I know it'll work. And, and when you can have little things like we beat Bellerman, who's I got a lot of respect for Scott Davenport done a good job. Great program. We beat them on the road. That gets a little bit more buy-in from your guys. It's like, Oh, okay. This stuff's working a little bit, right? Like, um, you know, so I, I think uh, just understanding it's a, it is an absolute process because uh, there are those dark moments. So man, like when you get, we lost by, I'm going to tell you 30 to, to Marshall who's been, they've been, they got a really good team. They've been beating a lot of teams up pretty good, but like, man, it was just, man, I was so down. I'd never been 30 balled like that in a game. And I was just like, man, I told our staff, I was like, fellas, my God, I was, I was, I was up in arms. 
Mm-hmm. Then I, they kind of t- brought me back down to keep me in a little neutral spot before I went and talked to our team. I don't want to ever be emotional talking to our team, um, you know, but I am going to hold them to the standard as far as our togetherness and how, how hard we play. Um, it, but, uh, but I also understand that it is a marathon. So uh, this, and this is more of a passion of mine as, a, as someone that works in uh, public education, mental health. I, we've talked to lots of coaches about promoting their players' mental health, but for you, we wanted to kind of get into maybe the promotion more of your own mental health, whether it's the beginning of the season, the middle of the season, towards the end of the season, you know, how do you physically and mentally try to keep yourself healthy through, as you describe the marathon? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, you know, I, uh, what, I won't even say the guy's name, uh, another head coach at, when I was in the big East, he said, Hey man, make sure you get a therapist. <laughs> That's what he told me. He said, I'm telling you, he said, it's the best thing I've ever done. Best thing I've ever done. He said, man, I get to go vent once a week to somebody. Um, I, my, my wife wears a lot of hats. So she, she's probably my, more of my therapist. Um, uh, you know, so I, 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 you know, I'll talk to her a lot. I'll talk to my brother a lot, a lot, a lot, just as I would do for him too. Like, listen, like if I feel like he's, a, if they're ever struggling or, or doing something, man, I'm going to be reaching out to him. I'm going to be talking to him. Right. Like you, 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 you figure out, I keep my circle very, very, very tight, probably even tighter than I ever have, uh, after, after, after Xavier, my Xavier experience, man, I, I keep it super, super, super tight. And I rely on a few people, whether it's my wife, whether it's my brother, um, you know, my staff, like I said, man, I, I hired a couple really good friends of mine that can really coach, but they're, they get it, you know, they get it. So I, I, I really rely on those guys. I do think it's probably smart to get a therapist. I have not done that yet, but maybe I will here in the near future, but because it can be hard. Listen, man, like the expectations and the and the pressure uh, that these jobs have, man. I mean, it is people don't understand it until you go through it, until you're in those shoes. You just don't. And it's um, it's different when you're an assistant. I know that compared to when all of a sudden you're a head coach, man. It's like you feel like sometimes the weight of the the weight of the world's on your shoulders, and you got to you can't get bogged down by all that though. You just got to focus on the things that that you can control. And that's, you know, your work ethic, your, your ability to focus, right. Coaching your team every single day, uh, being a great person every single day and just helping others, man. And, um, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, I will say that, man, it's a lot easier said than done. Uh, so you had like, you have a kind of unique experience. You move from one deep run program to another and they're like, what, 45 minutes away, right. Real close to each other. Um, I guess I want to, talk to you about like maybe what are some of the advantages of that and then what were maybe some of the the the, down, the downsides of that right uh, whether it's proximity to your old play whatever whatever it may be I'm sure I'm sure yeah. it goes both ways yeah you know uh so we were down at our house down in Florida when Miami job opened up and uh, my wife said hey Miami job opened up within literally within five minutes David Saylor our athletic director called and 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 uh, we spoke and um, we had a good conversation and I told my wife, I said, man, we got a lot to think about here. Uh, you know, uh, you know, talk about the advantages and disadvantages of it. Right. Like um, I said, Hey, listen, like, you know, it, if we, if we stay here, you know, probably not going to move. I mean, it's a 40 minute drive. Um, uh, Winston could stay our, our fourth grader could stay in the same school he's been in. He, you know, like my wife's family is from Cincinnati. Her mom and dad both live here. Two brothers live here. I mean, we're blessed with that. I mean, my mom and dad live in Indian, you know, just right outside of Indianapolis, which isn't far, um, which is awesome for family. But, you know, how things ended with Xavier, uh, I just said, hey, listen, you, you can't have the, the you know, bitter feelings, right? We got to be able to move on. You know, and I, I, you know, I thought that could be a struggle for, for my wife specifically, you know, she deals with, you know, whether it's her her friends and just circle, you know, you know how it is. It's just for my son, for Winston, does that make it hard? Is that a little bit of a challenge as well? Um, And ultimately we decided, Hey, listen, we got a, we got too good of an opportunity at Miami. Um, It's a great university, a great fit. And, 
you know, allows us to be able to, uh, to be still around our family and allows me still to be able to chase my dreams. And um, sometimes it's kind of nice in a way being 40 minutes away because does it feel like it overtakes your whole life? If that makes sense for my, and I'm talking specifically more for my family. Like, I will tell you this, like everything, everywhere I went, everywhere my son went, everywhere my wife went. I mean, it was just on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I'm just telling you when I was a Xavier. And they felt that every single day, whether it was, hey, whether we had a big win or, man, the fans are going crazy at my wife during the games. Like, it was wild. And I, I think, like, now it's like, hey, you know what? We're 40 minutes away. So it's, it's not like every every breath that you have is that. I don't know if that makes sense, but I think that's kind of been nice for my family in a way. Um, you know, I think they they uh, I think they're enjoying life uh, because of that a heck of a lot more. Yeah, I think it's you're just not as saturated and immersed in it, in the whole community of it, uh, I think is kind of where you were trying to go there. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, and we're obviously up there. I'm up there a ton in Oxford. Mm -hmm. And so is my wife and family, but it's just, it's a different feel. And it's kind of nice. It's kind of like a little bit of a breath of fresh air. And, and listen, I, I can be happy coaching in Alaska. I could be happy coaching in, in, uh, you know, wherever London, I could coach anywhere. All right. I could live anywhere. I'm that type of guy. Uh, you just give me a team and I'm happy. Um, but like, you know, I want my wife to be happy and she deserves to be happy. And it's my job, you know, to help her find happiness. Right. And, and uh, I think this has been a, like I said, a, a, a fresh of uh, fresh air for her. So, which has kind of been nice. So an, an interesting twist, and, and this is another one I don't think Todd and I have really covered, but, you know, from, from a collegiate coach standpoint, and, and we've seen all kinds of things in the media with, with um, the, the way that, that athletes are responding and coaches are responding, but what can high school coaches do differently to help prepare their athletes for college athletics? And then for in you personally, anything you'd like to see done a little differently to kind of help those athletes be more prepared for college sports? Yeah. Um, listen, and this goes across the board, whether it's baseball or hockey or football, basketball, I think just, you know, holding kids accountable. I think that's where it all starts. And I, listen, I can't be afraid for a kid to transfer can't be afraid to lose a kid to a prep school or, a, or, or whatever, you know, the great players want to be coached. <laughs> they want to be coached. And, and it's the same thing at the college level. Listen, now with the transfer portal, you know, I mean, kick and leave here and then go be eligible uh, anywhere in the country. And we can't be afraid of that. You know, the standard is a standard. And, but I, I think uh, just the accountability piece, man, the details, because so many times, as you guys know, it's like, it, it's going to be hard to simulate the competitive. Um, just, uh, you know, everybody's good at this level, right? Everybody was the best player at their high school or one of the best players at their high school, leading scores, right? And and so it's like, it's hard to get that and create that, but you can push them, you know, like and you can't hold their feet to the fire. Um, you know, I, offense, defense doesn't really matter to me, but I do think the development piece is huge and I don't care what at level you're at. I don't care if you're in grade school, you're in uh, middle school. I mean, we do development year round at Miami, year round. We have individual workouts during the season. We don't, we don't, we, we don't waste at, listen, because otherwise if you just do it out of season. Well, you're wasting six months <laughs> where a guy could be getting better. And I think like, so we have plans for our guys of how, you know, individualized plans from a weight room perspective, from a basketball perspective of how they're going to get better. And I, I really challenge coaches to think in that way, because that gets an excite, creates some excitement for the player too. Cause then they feel like, wow, man, this guy's got a plan for me specific to me that gets them more excited to be in the gym. Right. And because uh, I don't care what offense and defense it is and all that stuff, but I do think development, uh, the fundamentals, man, like that's where it's at. I, I, I'm a firm believer in that. I don't care. NBA, it's the same thing. 
I think the great organizations, they develop their players. They get better. They get better. And uh, I think I think that would be where I would probably start. Well, this next question kind of ties in, but it's overall like team wise. And I guess we can specify it to players too, but how do you go about siding like and everybody uses different words for it? Uh, maybe goals for your for your team. Like, you know, what are you look what are you looking to accomplish? How you're, I guess, uh measuring progress, right? Um at the beginning of the season, maybe within the season, you know, you have to adjust that. Um you know, whether it's, you know, including the players, um, some things that you have as your non-negotiables, right, which everybody coach has. Um, and then, you know, how do you kind of make sure they're 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 challenging but yet attainable, right? Because if they're not attainable, right, it's it's, it's a big letdown for, for everyone involved. You know, so we have our four core values in our program. You know, carry your brothers, one. Compete at every moment is two. Embody undeniable confidence is three. And then four is strive for Majus. Our guys all know what those things are. The key is to have your culture guardrails. Like how are you keeping, how are you holding yourselves accountable to those things? So I think that's where I always start. Like, listen, and, and I have our guys, we meet as a team and we come up with our culture guardrails, right? Whether it's a hey, teammate falls on the floor, you go, you sprint to pick them up. Uh, when you get subbed out and hey, you do sprint off the floor, I want them to have some ownership in the guardrails decision. Now, ultimately, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna make those decisions. I could veto anything that they have, but I want them to have some type of ownership and a voice. I think that's important. Um, because then you start seeing it. Because when you figure out the culture pieces, when players start policing each other, oh man, that's when you start to really start to like, man, starting to click a little bit. And, but it's every day, as you guys know. And then I'd say, like, you know, for me, I have my uh, my analytical data stuff that I, I would love to meet. I don't really share that with our guys. It's a guiding tool for me uh, on, on things maybe that we're getting good at or need to get better at. Um, uh, but I don't really share that with our guys. I just tell our guys, hey, listen, our, our goal is to get better every day. That's all I care about. And, and have that attitude, you know, live out our culture every single day. Um, and, and then we grade out, you know, for example, like I'm trying to get defense to be more important here. It hasn't been in a while. And, and, uh, just trying to get that, uh, you know, we grade out every single practice. We grade out every, everything we compete every day in practice. So like we go good versus good and we, we track all this data and our guys see that they see that every day to create that competitive culture, right. Compete at every moment. Um, cause I know if we live out our culture, listen, at the end of the day, we're going to get to where we want to go. All right. And, and, you know, so that's why we just say, Hey, every day is a new day to grow. I just want to see growth. That's all. Even win loss. I don't even worry about all that. <laughs> I mean, obviously I want to win, but like at the end of the day, man, I just want to see us getting better. And, and the analytical data doesn't lie, but our guys, if you start going too in depth with them, Hey, this is what this is. I, I think you'll lose the guys. I'll be like, huh? Uh, you know, I think you got to give them, you know, uh, it's the culture stuff is is the key for me. So you, I want to follow up on that a little bit. You mentioned, you know, player led, and that's kind of when you have that clicking. Um, you know, how do you go about helping your players to know what that looks like, right? Because I think a lot of times it could be, yeah, I'm leading, but it isn't in the right kind of way, right? Like they they might not know what it what it's supposed to look like, whether. Yep. Be negativity or how tone and, and things like that. So how, how do you go about helping your players kind of realize that there's a, there's a way to do it and how to go about it? You're not necessarily making everybody happy all the time, but by being respectful of your, your teammates, others and things like that. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, th I feel like and this has probably been for a while. I think kids nowadays are very sensitive. Um. You have to be able to talk to your teammates during live play. Not after the fact, not when there becomes a media timeout in three minutes. Like we have to be able to do it now. Right. And, and you have to be able to, re to receive that information and take that information in the right way. But you also have to be able to deliver that information in the right way. 
right? And, and not everybody's the same. I think you got to understand your audience, right? Like um, I may be able to get on a certain guy a little bit more than I maybe have to kind of coddle another guy. How are we going to get the most out of each individuals? And I, I, I always tell those guys, you, you develop uh, credibility with your teammates. Through, you gotta, they got to be able to trust you that you're about the right things. Right. And then you have to own things. I think that's really important is if a leader owns things, guys are a lot more receptive to li listening to them. They just are because they don't always feel like they're being blamed or all being pointed at nonstop. So learning how to, I, I try to teach our, our older guys how to develop credibility, um, tone, really important, understanding who you're talking to, really, really important. And then I try to show them the good stuff, right? Whether I, I see something like in an NBA game or another college basketball game or uh, something on social media that's about leadership, man, like, you know, are, are they, those guys love those, love those things. They just do because they feel like, oh man, this is kind of special for me, right? Like I'm going to, coach really wants me to do this. And uh, I just think giving them, giving them good examples as well. And then calling out when it is about, hey, you could have done this instead. This is probably what you should have done in this instance. And just as much as we coach the X's and O's, man, you got to coach a leadership. You have to. And being able to communicate with players on the floor and the fly, because the great teams can fix things on the fly. The bad teams have to wait until you get to the media timeout, mm -hmm. and then the coach tries to fix it. The great teams can fix it live. And, man, and that's hard to get to, and that's something we're striving for here at Miami. So as we get into our last two segments, the first one we call 30 second timeout. Uh, this is a very loose 30 second. There's no official in your uh, in your timeout uh, telling you to get them out. Uh, but this is kind of our platform. We give all of our guests to discuss whatever they want. It can be about you or Miami basketball or your family or something you want our listeners to know about or uh, we've had guests turn it on Todd and ask Todd and I a question. So this is kind of your your platform, your your next 30, 60, 90, whatever you want to take seconds um, to kind of just take the floor. Yeah, you know, I, I'm going to talk about Miami. I, I think, you know, the reason I chose this job at the end of the day that I decided to take the job was the brand. Listen, we haven't won in 16 years, but like I said, listen, this is the all-time winningest program in this league, more, more, one more games, one more championships, with more guys in the NBA than any other program. All right. So there's a tradition of winning here. The former players take incredible pride in this place, incredible pride. Then you add on to that, man, it's like the academics. You talk about the brand anywhere out of time I wear like Miami gear out or whatever it is. It's like, man, like this is an original public Ivy school. Right. So this is an elite academic school, elite. It makes us different than every other program at our level in the mid-major level. It makes us different than every other program in the Midwest. It does. So we have a niche. So somebody that values the education piece and they like the basketball piece, I think you can get the best of both worlds here. And then when kids have a chance to come visit here, like this is the picture perfect setting of college. It's in a college town, but you're close enough to a city. Um, but like there's 19,000 students um, there's just that social life, man. There's people buzzing around everywhere. It just has that great, great, great feel. And the brand is really strong. And, and that, that's been built up for hundred over a hundred years. Right. So like uh, that, that's why I, I knew the brand was still in place. And, and I was like, man, if we could just get this thing, a little bit of energy put into the program and I hire a great staff, man, we're going to get this thing turned around very, very, very quickly. So um, Miami's unique, man. I'm excited to be here, obviously, but I think the more people get to campus and stuff, I think they'll start to see how special of a place it really is. All right. Last seven quick hitters, kind of rapid fire, random, random questions, not necessarily about basketball. Um, kind of go over a place here, have some fun. Uh, your favorite holiday movie. Christmas vacation. Okay. That's I like one. it. Good choice. <laughs> Um, all right. Favorite food to eat as a Thanksgiving leftover, man. I'm not a big leftovers guy. I'm a, I'll, I will be very clear on that, but if I had to pick one, oh man, I just probably, I like ham. I don't, I'm not as big of a Turkey guy. All right. So 
I'd probably go with him, but I'm not a big leftovers guy. All right, your favorite athlete growing up? Larry Bird. Probably an obvious choice. <laughs> Indiana yeah. kid, Dan yeah. Bell. Love uh, Larry Legend. All right, your first job you ever had as a kid, as a youth? <laughs> Working on a farm. You know, Danville's very rural, all right? And uh, my dad, my grandpa was a farmer. And he said, hey, listen, we got a job for you. And I said, hey, man, I want to make some money. I need to get some gas money. You know, 16 years old, got my car. You know, I feel really good. And they said, okay, well, we got a job for you. And so I show up the first day, have no idea what to expect. I start having to clean pig pens. And like, there's these <laughs> really long, like, I'm talking like, I don't know, probably 30 foot. Like you'd have like, I don't know, like 30 pigs in that one. And the next one you had 30. And there's like rows and rows and rows of this stuff. Well, I'd go through it. I'd have to shovel, you know, it, the stuff out. And, and then literally within five minutes, it would look like I didn't do anything. <laughs> right. So then not only did I, okay, so I did that and I was like, man, this is awful. All right. Number one, but then you smell it the rest of the day. I mean, like, it just, it smells like it's on you, man. You go home and you shower, you're trying to scrub like, man, it was, a, I, I got, I did get paid. All right. Uh, $8 an hour. Uh, but man, it was a, it was tough work. All right. You're, uh, you mentioned playing with your brothers. How, how long did it take to like start competing with them when you were playing against them? Like wh when was that point where it clicked? Like, okay, I can hang a little bit. I'm not getting, I'm not getting beat up here and I can compete. Yeah, man, it took a while. You know, he's about 10 years older than I am, but it, uh, when I got to high school, I felt like, man, I was good. You know, like he couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't touch me anymore. <laughs> uh but you know but again like i said man i was the youngest of five and uh man all i had three brothers i had one sister and boy they, they would try to beat up on me as much as possible man when i was young but then it turned it turned you know so and uh hopefully it'll continue to turn even when we play akron this year here in january so that's gonna be a hard game for my mom by the way <laughs> so i was just that was gonna be I, I just actually tweaked the last question i was gonna ask so Akron plays Miami of Ohio. What's going on in the stands, coach? Oh, man. Uh, so I got to say thank you to Ricky Stokes, uh, the MAC, uh, his associate commissioner. Uh, he, we only play once this year <laughs> on paper right now. He could play the MAC tournament as well. So that probably helps my mom. Um, but, man, <laughs> I, she's going to be split. I don't know if she's going to do one of those shirts. It's like half Akron, half, half Miami. Half, yeah. Yeah. You know, she's got to do something creative, right? I mean, like – you can't just wear one exactly. for a half and then flip it over at halftime and do a different one. Like, I think you got to do the half and half. Well, and then I'm wondering, you know, who are the siblings rooting for? Are we picking, the, you know, are we picking sides here? And, uh, that'll be the interesting We're going to see who's really on my team. <laughs> that's, that's what we're going to see. <laughs> well, coach, this was, we have had so much fun and, and there was such great content. We really do appreciate you being on the episode today and, and, we are big now, big fans of Miami men's basketball. Thank you guys for having me, man. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for listening to another episode of the After the Timeout podcast in concert with the Illinois Basketball Coaches Association. Please remember to give us a five star rating wherever you may listen. For more show content and upcoming episodes, follow us on Twitter at After the Timeout and subscribe to our podcast for upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening.